Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast. My name is Dane Grunewald, CEO of Huddle3 Group, and I'm really pleased to be uh, wel- welcoming a good friend and colleague, Jeff Miller, the CEO and founder of Potential Workforce. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you, Dane. Good to be with you. Yeah. It's been a good while since we were together in person, but I've really enjoyed uh, staying in touch with a lot of the progress you and uh, your business have been making uh, down there in Houston through the last couple of years with the pandemic. Did it's you, it's uh, been a wild ride. We're, we're really fortunate when we when we think about when we started. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and obviously didn't know that the pandemic was coming. We started in, in 2019. And so 2020 was a big year for us. But then, then to go into the p- pandemic and come through it uh, and have actually grown the business substantially, we're, we're really grateful for that. Yeah. And, and we, it, it's a common statement, you know, COVID and what we've come through is creating huge opportunity for acceleration on, on some new themes, some new ways of, of doing business, of supporting teams and, and none more so than uh, neurodiversity. But before we jump into the work uh, that you're doing with Potential Workforce around neurodiversity and other projects. Maybe you could uh, give the listeners a little bit of a, a background story on you. You know, How did you find yourself in this CEO and founder position? What's the journey been so far? Sure, happy to. Uh, so I was born and raised outside Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, went to school up there. Spent my first couple of decades uh, in the Bay State and um, really didn't have any idea what I wanted to do coming out of school. Um, I'd, I'd play four years of basketball and, and I knew I wasn't going to go pro. But other than that, I really didn't have a good a good handle. And um, just through networking and people that I knew, I ended up getting into the staffing industry. I started out as a recruiter, then moved into sales then moved into management uh, with one company I was with for about 11 years. They moved me out to the West Coast. Um, we opened up an office, our first office uh, in Silicon Valley, and then one office became five. Uh, on the West Coast, um, uh, uh, assumed a, a larger role with the company, and then and then the company sold. Um, and um, I was looking for uh, other things to do. I, I, I sort of felt like I'd learned at least the basics of the staffing industry, hopefully in yeah. eleven years. Uh, you know, and, and hopefully a little bit more than that. And I was wondering, you know, what else was out there. And so I got into project consulting, and I, mm-hmm. I, I liked that side of things. I was in the healthcare side for uh, for about four years. And um, uh, really enjoyed that, really enjoyed the level of engagement that you have with customers that's sometimes a little different. A lot of times in the staffing side, cu- customers can keep you at arm's length and have you, you yep. know, work through a portal or through a middle, middle person or what have you. And on the project side, you got a chance to really work with executives and, and, and um, understand where they wanted to go and help to hopefully help them to get there. And I really like that. Um, I liked the scale and the impact you could have at scale and staffing, but I liked the, you know, the one-on-one interaction with executives on the on the the project side. I didn't think I'd get back into staffing, but I got offered a position um, yep. to run a global staffing company, as you know, and um, it was a wonderful opportunity. So I had a chance to to run day-to-day operations for a company and really see how things how things work, um, uh, you know, from at, at all aspect you know, in all aspects of the business. The uh, general counsel reported to me, you know, the whole, the whole thing, right. IT sales. Um, and that was a wonderful opportunity. Um, and, and so, um, I stayed in the business, uh, for, uh, um, you know, probably for about 20 years in total, um, with, with a, with a brief detour in, um, in the, in the project consulting side. And I sort of brought that to the, some of the staffing companies that I worked uh, with thereafter. Uh, but yeah, that's that's sort of the background, you know, generally having larger levels of responsibility over time as you go, but a lot of work in human capital, project consulting and and, and recruiting, really. Neat. And that project consulting uh, experience, when you talk about the engagement, uh, I think we're seeing more and more business relationships go in that direction, whether they're consulting or not consulting, is that there needs to be more engagement, there needs to be more co-design, co-development of whatever it is that we're trying to do. It may be a solution, or it might be deploying software, it may be designing a new supply chain partnership. Um, but but you are seeing this theme of teams that expand outside of the boundaries of the traditional organization and org chart. So that was an interesting kind of um, 
I guess, revelation for you at that earlier stage of your career, finding the enjoyment there. It was, it was. And I think, you know, it's got to be the right fit, but, but I see, you know, organizations that are looking to take a larger role with their clients. Yep. But I also see clients that are looking for companies that will put a little skin in the game and, and will invest more. Maybe maybe there's a, a, a different level of relationship. There may be some differences in terms of the terms, yep. right? Some su- success, you know, fees and engagements and things like that. But in general, I just liked that that partnership and that ability yeah. to, you know, we, we were in the healthcare side. We ended up working with sort of small to mid-sized hospitals. And we got a real chance to see how their business worked and work with a you know, chief, uh, chief technology officer that might've been a doc as well, you know, and, and some yeah. really, some really cool people that, that, that you get a chance to meet and, you know, they, they want value from what you're providing. They're re- really willing to give a little bit more versus sometimes in the staffing side, at least in the past, we don't find this with potential at all, which I'm happy about, Yeah, but with some staffing companies, you can sort of get put in a box over here, right? You're not um, part of the team. You're not really part yeah. of the team. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I liked that. I knew I liked that just in terms of a day to day and being able to interact with customers where you felt like they um, they saw the value that you brought. Yeah. Right? And now what we're doing, we're really we're really working with customers on a number of different levels. We're working with them to solve problems that they have, but also kind of on a core values level, um, mm-hmm. you know, where we're where we're able to al- make sure that we align with them. And so those are interesting conversations to have with executives, especially. Yeah, neat. So let's let's come on to potential workforce in a little more detail. Um, you've you've had that twenty years in staffing and project consulting, and and then you wake up one day with this brilliant idea to start a new business. You know, how did that come about? So that came about really. Um, the, the two stars of that show are are my son and my wife. Yeah. Uh, so my son Charlie was diagnosed at six as autistic. And so when he was about 16, I started doing research, but it really didn't have anything to do with the work that I was doing at the time. I, I knew that this was a cause that I cared about because of my son, I was going to support in whatever way, but I might support a nonprofit or something like that. But I had no idea at all when I started that this might be ultimately where my career would go. Yeah. But I wanted to find out as a, as a dad, we'd, we'd, we'd gotten pretty good and parents can relate to this hopefully. And kind of looking at that year-to-year approach, like, okay, what can we do to help Charlie be his best self as a sixth grader, seventh grader, eighth grader? Yeah. And that had worked pretty well. Not perfect, lots of bumps in the road, you know, some tears along the way, but but pretty well. And I realized that, okay, if, if I were to look at him as a 16-year-old then and say, well, what about 26? What about 36? Yeah. I, I had to admit to myself, I really didn't have a good picture of what that was going to look like. And sometimes the year-to-year stuff was pretty consuming. So I, I'll give myself a little bit of a pass on that. Yeah. But I realized I needed to up my game. I needed to really be thinking about what that was going to look like for, for Charlie. So that's how the whole thing started for me, yeah. was starting to ask those questions and learning things like 25% of the population is, is, um, <clears throat> is neurodistinct. Right? I didn't know, as a parent even, and someone who was I, I felt was fairly well-educated on the topic, I had no idea the number was that big yeah. because if you include things like ADHD and dyslexia and PTSD, which changes mm-hmm. the way brains are wired, then you're talking about at least 25% of the population that's walking around, as we say, or was explained to me, basically with a different operating system. Right? Yeah. And it's, it's not it's not worse. It's not better, but it's different. And yeah. so you're walking around with this operating system and and the world is set up on another operating system. then you know, how, how are you going to be, you, then, then your strengths are going to be minimized and your challenges are going to be maximized. Yes. Uh, and, and so that was one thing that I found that really hit home for me, um, along with that 25% number, right? So, so you start to see as, as I was researching that a lot of these individuals are really exceptional in their abilities, uh, and their strengths. Now they yep. may have some mitigating areas, some challenges, some areas, especially for companies that aren't accommodating to those, they could be a little problematic, but most of them are really kind of basic stuff. You know, mm-hmm. I was finding people were talking to me about things like moving somebody from cubic, the cubicle that's next to the kitchen and the copier and has lots of sensory overload potential yes. to a quieter place over here in the corner. Well, who cares, right? If, I mean, if, they're, if they're a great accountant, then 
that's certainly a win for the company, right? And 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 a very low cost solution. So I was I was learning things like that as I was talking to all sorts of people about my son, right? And and having that employment background, I was thinking about work, but also about you know social life and all these kinds of things. Um, so the twenty five percent number really really surprised me. The other number that just blew me away was for someone like Charlie, who is autistic, but will go to a four-year college, will probably graduate with a GPA better than mine. Not yeah. that that's a great shakes. Um, <laughs> he's looking at like an 80% unemployment rate. Yeah. Which just blew me away, right? It's, how is that even possible? I, I knew enough to know that there are a lot of people who are profoundly affected by their autism, sometimes nonverbal, sometimes lots of challenges, right? Um and, but I still feel like those individuals have a lot to contribute if only people will meet them where they are. Yeah. Um, this was a more traditional sense where, like, I know Charlie's going to go to, again, I'll go to a four-year college. Do You know, I, I believe he'll do well. And so, you know, I knew about the labor shortages out there, and yet we're still seeing 80% unemployment. That's crazy. So the 25% number surprised me. The 80% number blew me away. And now I started to think about this in, in the context of what I do and, and learning mm-hmm. about how, how big companies are, are dealing with time to fill and, and turnover issues and things like that. And, and I said, well, okay, so this population is, is, uh, is high, you know, very low turnover, high productivity. In a lot of ways, they make ideal employees. Yeah. But they may not interview the way that people are used to seeing folks interview. So they may not be the best interview in the classic sense. But they make wonderful employees. And yet, when I was looking at it, less than, I want to say, 5% of the Fortune 500 was doing anything constructively around neurodiversity. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, you know, huge benefits here. And yet, very few people are doing it. But the folks that are doing it are telling me it's, it's incredibly impactful on their business in a variety of ways. And, and I started thinking, okay, this is, this is the path for Charlie. But this is also something that maybe with my skills, whatever they are, I can apply them to this. Because I saw a real business need there um, and people that that understand how these big corporations work. I didn't come from a nonprofit background and a lot yeah. of people who come from that background of, do amazing things. But I know sometimes there's a disconnect between, you know, that individual and somebody who's running a, you know, six billion dollar division. Right. Yeah. And, and I felt like I might be able to bridge that gap a little bit. So that was what took me from from just the research project and learning about Charlie and, and what he might need as a 26 year old in that instance to thinking, wow, maybe I should, I should, you know, take a step and, 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 uh, um, you know, and not just support, uh, you know, uh, 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 nonprofits that I care about, although I do that, but, but maybe I should, I should make this my full-time work. Cause the more I, I learned about it, the more passionate I became, the more I just fell in love with this community, even yeah. beyond my son and his friends. Um, to just see, uh, you know, it, it's, it's incredibly re- rewarding what we get to do on an ROI level, but also yep. on kind of a core values and a, and a head and a heart level. So that just, it just, it just pulled me in and ultimately allowed me to, uh, 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 you know, with my wife's blessing yes. uh, to, uh, to, to, to found this startup at a time when not a lot of people knew about neurodiversity uh, back in 2019. Yeah, I think you were the first person who introduced me to that term. And uh, I don't know, it's kind of like when you buy a new car and all of a sudden you start seeing that same model of car on the road all the time. I don't know if I just was uh, naive and not you know, being aware of it or that you were, you know, it's probably a mix of both. You were at the front end of this big change because now I see it everywhere, uh, which is great and, and naturally uh, in large part to companies like yours and, and some of those not-for-profits for really driving the agenda. No, we, we, uh, I had the same situation to me. Once once people explained it to me, yeah. once I really understood neurodiversity, you, you see it everywhere. Yeah. And that's, that's a lot that's true about the candidates as well. A lot of these candidates are kind of hiding in plain sight, right? They're, yeah. They're, you know, and, and, you know, with 25% of the population, everybody knows somebody who's, who's, yes. um, who's neurodistinct. Now, that can cut both ways, right? Because... It, it can build some empathy or some understanding about how incredibly capable folks are. Yep. But sometimes I see that it leads people to make assumptions because they know someone who's autistic, let's say. Uh, they think they, that that's what autism is. Yeah. Yep. Right. So a lot of our work is is educating 
uh, folks who who just are new, uh, who've come new to, to neurodiversity, and the, the the term itself was only coined in 1998. So this is a, a relatively new phenomenon. Although I want to point out, neurodiversity has existed forever. Right? Yes. Um, you know, and, and and people talk about you know Mozart and Da Vinci and all these amazing people who we really think were nerd neurodiverse. Yeah. Um, and nerd is think. Um, uh, but the term was only con- you know uh, coined in in 98. So a lot of people don't don't know about it. Um, oh, so right. for, us, for lots of a lot, a lot of it is education and a lot of it is then overcoming sometimes that perception that, oh yeah, I know what that is. I've got a nephew who's autistic and you know, whatever the, right. And, and so they, they kind of get locked into that. Yeah. So, you know, neither of which is, is um, both of which are understandable, neither of which are particularly helpful, right? We want to let people know inc- how incredibly broad the population is because uh, uh, neurodiversity is that, you know, niece that you have who's nonverbal, yes. you know, who needs a lot of supports. It's also Elon Musk. Yeah. And right? it's also Richard yeah. Branson. Yeah. So that's, 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 that's the breadth of neurodiversity. Yeah, that's neat. And you used a great phrase earlier about operating system, which I really like, and I've got some questions around that. But traditionally, you've seen autism attached to ability and disability, particularly in allowing some people to access certain services, probably at, you know, one portion of the spectrum. Um, and, and you know, now you're starting to see some of the language that you read where we're talking about superpowers. We're talking about people like Musk and Branson, which is great. It's a great change in, in framing the opportunities. I liked an, another one that you said, you know, improving, increasing the strengths and reducing the challenges versus the opposite. So, so what is it coming back to that operating system that potential workforce is really focusing on doing with some of your customers? Are you, um, working more with the customer organizations to be more accommodating to these different operating systems? Are you helping the individuals and your distinct individuals to, to, uh, you know, pivot and change some elements of their operating system? Is it a mix of both? I'd be intrigued by that. Yeah. So, so the, the, the offering that we started the company with is something called stars. Mm -hmm. And we also have a, a group called projects where we outsource projects uh, tech and data projects, building websites, dashboards, things like that. Yeah. And we'll outsource that work and we'll, we'll, we'll staff that with majority neurodistinct individuals. So we're providing them with maybe contract to hire or growth opportunities. And we're also showing the creativity and the innovation that comes when you have a largely neurodistinct team. Yes. So that's projects. Um, and projects came up for us in, in 2019 or 2020, excuse me. But the offering that we started with, and the, and the offering that's that, that's that's our our I would say it's our number one focus today, is called Stars, mm-hmm. and Star stands for Spectrum Training, Recruitment, and Support. So Spectrum being sort of that legacy term, autism spectrum. When we started out, we were really focused on the autism side, and then we quickly realized, wow, there's a broader community here that we want to serve. You know, I started uh, the autism side for personal reasons. For me, that was the place to start. But then we saw that there was really a lot of momentum around the concept of, of neurodiversity. Yeah. But star, so 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 spectrum is the first S there, and then it's training, recruiting, and support, and those are the services that we offer as part of the program for stars. And training, mm-hmm. to your question, Dane, is is majority the majority of the training is for the employer. Yeah. Because what we find is that that individual who graduated from, you know, UCLA. Right. With with a, with a nice GPA and they're they're You know, they've got a marketable set of skills, but they're not going to interview in a way you're traditionally used to. Yeah. You know, they're going to they're going to struggle a bit. But but they to a certain extent, they are what they are. Right. What they need is companies that are that are more accommodating to them. Mm-hmm. And when we look at it in, in, in um, I don't often use um, terms like disability with with our community, because yeah. most people who are neurodistinct don't consider themselves disabled. Right. Sure. It's part of their identity as much as it is being gay or being left handed or what have you. Right. That's how yeah. the majority of our folks see it. And so out of respect for that, I rarely talk about that. But if you think about a difference, if a company is not accommodating to it, it can be a limiting factor for sure. Right. right? If you want to call it a disability. Um, but but so the companies need to understand the benefits. First of all, what is neurodiversity? Um, what are the business benefits of it? 
Mm-hmm. And then how to create a more inclusive environment that's more welcoming to folks like that. And and so, you know, if you if if you had someone who was in a wheelchair, of course, the fact that your building doesn't have a ramp would be a shortcoming for you, not for them, right? They they can't help that, right? Yeah. They, they, it's, it's part of their reality. Is there in a wheelchair? Right. Yep. You would see that as a limiting factor for the business that they w- couldn't couldn't have people access the, the company they're in a wheelchair. It's the same thing in, from a neurodiverse perspective, right? So the majority of the training that we do is is company side, where we, mm-hmm. we train them on how to write a proper job description, how to interview. Interviewing is probably the number one thing that trips up these candidates right. because they'd be wonderful on a random Tuesday afternoon. They'd be heads down doing great work, right, in that corner cubicle, let's say, right? Yeah. Um, but they're not going to interview in a way that tradi- oftentimes it, it traditionally is, is going to work. So how do we create systems and, and design a process that's predictive, number one, because it's got to be the right, you know, the right person getting into that role who can really thrive. Yeah. Um, but it's also inclusive, it's fair to everybody, right? Allows people who who don't necessarily have, um, you know, those traditional interviewing skills, the ability to still show what they can do. Um, so so it's, it's, it's training, it's recruiting, and then it's support. Once candidates get hired, we support both on the back end for a structured 90-day process to help them sort of get up to speed. Really, the, the biggest things that we do from a training perspective for the candidates, and I think this is important to note, we're, we're not looking to change them. Our, our mm-hmm. candidates don't want us to cure their autism. They would be totally offended by that concept, right? Again, this is part of their identity, part of who yeah. they are. But, you know, help me to understand um, what the corporate environment is like that I'm maybe going into. Right. right? And number two... If you think of the, you know, our typical candidates got, you know, a uh, couple years of, of, of experience out of school. That experience was typically with companies that are not very accommodating. Right. Unfortunately, a lot of them have, di- have had difficult experiences. So the biggest thing that we train our new hires on is self-advocacy. Right. Because a lot of them have, have had difficult situations in the past where uh, and we, we just did this training for a customer uh, just last week. Um, where we were talking about, listen, if you know what someone is dealing with, you can you can deal with it yourself. You can help support them in whatever ways the company allows. There may be an accommodation that's requested that you can't right. accommodate, right? But just by the act of listening, you're going to be you're going to be ahead of the game. And as a as a leader, you always want to know what your folks are dealing with if it's affecting their their ability to work and they're comfortable to share it. So self-advocacy is a big thing for us. We work right. on both sides with that. Um, but that's, those are really the, the main things, right? What's, what's the company about? And, and, and let's talk about how you can, let's talk about the language you can use to advocate for yourself in a respectful yeah. way, in a way that's going to contribute to the, the, the business being better. Right. I think I'd be, you know, happier and more productive if, Yes. Right. Is that possible? Right. We, yeah. we we put them in the seat. We give them that that training. That's really the majority of it. The vast majority of it is on that on the client side because they're the ones that that really need it. Frankly, that 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 um, oh yeah, that need to see this as a competitive advantage. Yeah. So if if, if company A is 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 really leveraging this twenty five percent of the population, and company B is not. That's a huge competitive advantage for company A. Huge. Right? And so that's really what we talk about with businesses when we're talking about their, you know, sort of the, 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 the what, why, and how of neurodiversity. Yeah. Right? That's the why. You, know, you, you want to access this population because the war on talent isn't going away. No. And there's some brilliant work. I think you've pointed me to some of the work that talks about um, – neurodiversity in in teams and the fact that you can very quickly reframe problems or get to the root cause of an issue or come up with a whole new idea because you're not um you're not driving from a place of kind of conformity of of thoughts and social rhythm you're you're actually you're actually changing up the environment in that team could you perhaps give us some examples of that or or share some some stories that, that that really have caught your attention in that space. One of the things that we find is interesting about this space is that the larger the company, the more sort of institutional inertia. Yes. 
makes it more challenging for people to step outside that in a respectful way yeah. and say, what about X? What about Y? Or I'm struggling to understand this, right? There's different types of, a big concept for us is psychological safety. Yes. Right? It was creating teams where there's psychological safety. Google did a study on it. It consistently comes up as the number one predictor of team success. Yeah. Is the ability to disagree without being disagreeable, to, to uh, uh, admit um, weak spots or challenges or, you know, Dan, you just trained me on that, but I'm having, I, I'm miss, I feel like I'm missing something, right? Yes. Let, me, let, me, let me confirm with you. Let me, you know, admitting that or saying, Dane, you're saying this is the best way to go. What if we went this way? Why wouldn't yeah. that be better, right? And having an environment where that's okay. It's okay to challenge your boss respectfully, those types of things. Yeah. Um, so, so um, we spend a lot of time on psychological safety. There's a there's a, a good story out uh, with Ernst and Young where they had a, a a cohort of new hires that was coming in, uh, fresh out of college, and I think it was on day three one of the individuals raised his hand to the instructor who was you know demonstrating this sort of well worn process that Ernst and Young had always used and it had really been proven to be you know he said why do we do it that way that's wrong we should do it this way. Right. The individual happened to be neurodistinct. Now, the fact that they said that's wrong on day three is probably, you know, something that we we, those of us who work a lot in the neurodistinct community are used to seeing. Right. You're going to get some some blunt honesty from people. But how refreshing and how great to have that. Yeah. The other thing that Ernst Young, Ernst Young's had a program for six or seven years and they've really worked hard on psychological safety from day one on getting candidates to the point where they can they can voice challenges you know how great to have people who literally think differently have that different different operating system that we talked about be able to look at how things are done and have the freedom to say what if we did it this way yeah well the Ernst and Young um, uh, process it turned out that the, the trainer was had enough foresight to say you know what let's park that let's you and I talk about that and I tell you what I'll make a commitment to you that if you're right if your process is better we'll change it and, and I'll go to bat for you. We'll implement that process if yours is better, and we'll teach that one. Yeah. Let's let's sidebar. And they did, and it turned out the guy was right. This new hire, this twenty you know twenty two year old, was right. Yeah. Um, and Ernst and Young never would have seen that if they hadn't if they hadn't uh, created that environment, and if that that trainer hadn't hadn't been as astute as they were. Well, this ended up being a multi million dollar savings wow. for Ernst and Young per year. Right. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing that, you know, when you hire folks who have who, who think a little bit differently. Yeah. And you create an environment where you leverage those those types of, you know, different different thoughts, then you can have you can have radical change, huge innovation and yes. huge, huge swings in terms of your competitive balance with the companies that you're out there trying to beat every day. Yeah. No, I, I think that's. It's important. I think it's something that uh, other people have stumbled across, but to be intentional about it and to have the opportunity to be intentional about it and know how to recreate it in your team is is uh, the really exciting part. You know, I, I, the, the intentional part is really key. Yeah. So uh, one other story that I'll share with you on that topic is, is one of the things that we find. Every, so uh, what, the feedback that we've gotten from our customers is that they, they like what we do because it's customizable. Yep. It's, it's not the same every time. It's ND led. Mm-hmm. So, so the training is led by folks who are neurodistinct themselves. So a cool. manager can ask a question to someone and say, well, why do we need to do it that way? And, the, and, the, and the, the individual can say, well, I can't speak for everyone, but I can tell you from my perspective, I would not apply to this job as it's written. And here's why. That's great. Yeah. Right. And some of the, yeah. wow. Right. Um, it, it's it's data driven. So all our stuff is based on uh, ROI and we survey every customer before and after when we me- measure and then we measure over time what mm-hmm. the impact is, not just in terms of new hires, but the team itself. Yeah. Because if you introduce psychological safety to the whole team, the whole team should become more productive and more engaged and, and, and right. And then it's holistic. So the things that we do that are neurodistinct tend to benefit everybody. Like if you put a good onboarding program in place, it's going to benefit everybody, right? So it isn't just about, and in fact, you do not want to devise processes just for the ND community because that's othering, right? That's not good, right? That's neat. But you want want to use that as an opportunity. And we find this all the time. 
that individuals who are, um, um, you know, who are neurodistinct um, and, and, and their team members who may not be, right? It, th- yeah. These programs are incredibly popular with these team members who are, who are what we call neurotypical, right? Yes. Who, who, uh, and, and they love it because they, they, they want a good mentoring program. They want a good onboarding program. They want to be able to share what, how they work best, how they're yeah. happiest and most productive, right? Everybody wants that. So neurodiversity is a way to, to, to start to move down that road you know, using leveraging the perspectives of these candidates. But to your to your point about intentional, every program we do is different, right? Every yeah. program is is it relies on core principles, but it's somewhat bespoke because every company is different. Every company is starting from a different point. And this is maybe what I learned, you know, doing workforce management, and project management, and things like that. Start where the company is. Yes. Leverage the stuff they do that already works, and make the tweaks where you need to make the tweaks. So every program is different. One thing that's the same every time we do this is the number of, of, of mid-career individuals yeah. who are part of that company who come forward and, and now start to disclose, right? So they might have been with the company for 10, 12, 15 years, never told a coworker or a boss or an HR individual that they are neurodistinct themselves, yes. that they're dyslexic or they're autistic or they're what have you. They see us doing this new hire program and they see the company being intentional about yes. it. Yes. And they th- it changes the calculus for them. They start to see that okay, the company's really leaning into this. And this is something the company clearly wants where before the stigma outweighed the possible stigma or or people looking at me differently outweighed the benefit to me. So I've struggled with the fact that I'm I've got Asperger's or I'm autistic or whatever. Yeah. And I haven't shared it with my team. I arguably couldn't bring my full self to work. But now I see that the company is doing this. And I want to come forward not only to share my experience, but maybe to be a mentor to those new hires because I know right. I didn't have that when I started. Yeah. And so just think about how that flips the script for the individual, right? And how engaged or, or not engaged uh, or how, you know, not optimally productive they probably were yeah. when they were stressed and not bringing their full selves to work. And now someone who wasn't part of our program at all is going to be much more engaged, much more productive, and their team members are going to feel that. And it has a real carry forward effect. But it's all because of that intentionality that, you know, this is what we're doing. You, 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 you know, part of working with companies is, is developing the right communication strategy for yeah. them. So that they can communicate to their, their own internal employees and fully have them fully appreciate the benefit that they're leaning into this, that they're leading on this. And companies still have the opportunity to be leaders in this, right? I mean- Yeah, it's so you new, know, it, so yeah, early. It, it, yeah, it's it's still not, uh, you know, that widely, you know, uh, uh, utilized still. No. So so you can be a leader in this space. We work with companies in energy and financial services and tech. And the companies that are doing this in, in their respective areas are part of a handful of companies that can legitimately say, hey, we're leading on this. We're out front on this. And it's wildly popular with their employees. Think about if you've got an employee who's a parent, like me, right? Who's got a a child who's coming up, right? And now their employer is stepping into this. How loyal is, you know, how how excited is that employee going to be? How more likely are they going to stay and continue to produce well for for um, for that company? Because they feel like the company... Uh, you know, their core, the core values thing again, right? Those core values yeah. are, are really aligning maybe more strongly than they ever had before. And that's what going back to the early part of the conversation you're alluding to, I guess, is that you, you help some of these companies to allow their core values to come to life through these programs for their, not only for their employees who are neurodistinct or have neurodistinct family members, but, but also for the others who, who benefit from that holistic program that you're talking about? Well, it's it's a it's a tangible, intentional way for people to live their values. Yeah. And, and what we find is that a lot of companies struggle with that. And I don't think that they're insincere, right? I think they believe yeah. that these are their values, but how do you operationalize that? Right. Right. And when you so do it's operationalize from, from onboarding to how we run meetings to how we talk to each other about where we're at and where we want to go. That's right. And when you do yeah. operationalize it, like SAP has done a really nice job with this. They right. they they really lean into it. They say this is part of our core process and they work with customers 
of theirs. Yes. And, and, and they'll meet with them and, and they'll link up with them on a core values level because they're saying, hey, this is something we're doing. Maybe this would benefit you. We'd love to talk to you about how we're, how we're doing it, right? Uh, yeah. And so now you're able to engage with your customers and, your, and maybe competitors or suppliers at a totally different level. Yeah. Um, and just to bring it full circle, I mean, I, I've definitely been the beneficiary of that. Where, you know, going back to our staffing days, you're not always invited to the, you know, you're not you're always yeah. given a seat at the table. Um, and, and yet in terms of what we do, when we're finding, when we're, when we're linking up with companies and we're doing, we're, we're aligning with their core values, that's something that executives can really get excited about, which is good because we, we need that executive support. Yeah. We need them to say, hey, this is where we're going. Yeah. Um, and then, then folks will follow because it's, it's a... You know, it's a it's a concept and it's a program that, you know, it's people people love it when they hear about it, when they learn what it is. We get really wide support for it, which is great. Yeah. And I think from all the conversations you and I have had and from my own readings with with family members that are neurodistinct, um, the one thing that I'm learning most in this conversation, Jeff, is that that fact that this can be. Uh, a holistic driver of competitive advantage in a business. And, you know, I, I'm working with a number of big companies right now who are actually starting to ask us for more help on how do we design our talent attraction strategies? How do we look at retention? And, and this is a great starting point. You know, even mm -hmm. though it might feel like it's very precise, the, the fact that it can start to build these systems um, that benefit the whole company and the company's customers um, is, is a really, really, you know, st strong direction to be investing in. Well, and, and, and the, the average neurodiversity program, the average neurodiversity program mm -hmm. has 96% retention. Wow. Right. That's average. So that's a big number. Now, part of that is, is the, um, is a lot of our candidates tend to be change averse. So mm -hmm. if, and this is a big if, if they're in a supportive environment, they tend to not go across the street for another five grand, right? It means yes. more to them to stay where they are if they're in a good supportive environment and they're able to, you know, they're 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 unshackled, right? They're free to to, to you know to to just let it fly and 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 really do what they can do and innovate and be creative and be productive. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and and the things we do to help them get there are the same things that benefit every employee. Like yeah. You were saying. Right. Well, so there's a real holistic connection, I think, is 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 something that um, as we educate people on what neurodiversity is, we always try and let them know, you know, look, this this done well, this should benefit your entire your entire employee pool. Uh, quick, quick story. Um, it, it benefits your leaders as well. So yeah. I had a CIO who reached out to me and said and, and out of the blue and said, Jeff, I want to thank you. And I said, okay, what, 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 tell me why, what'd I do? And he said, well, I've got a bit of a re reputation as a hard guy. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I drive results. I expect results. I push my people hard. But since you guys have had your program, I've had a half a dozen people that have sought me out individually to let me know that they're neurodis neurodistinct. Yes. That were already in my organization, but I never knew. Yeah. And it gave me the opportunity to meet with them as 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 human beings, to 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 work with them one on one, to for them to see. I was very conscious of them seeing how I received that information yeah. and how supportive I was of them as individuals. Now it doesn't mean that I'm still not a driver. I am, but it, it, you gave me an opportunity. This is this guy saying to me, CIO of of a you know Fortune 500 company. Yeah, you gave me the opportunity to show my people that I care about them. Yes. Right, that I'm invested in them, that I'm yeah. still going to drive them just as hard, but I respect them as individuals. I respect the differences in our in our in our teams. That's a strength of ours, and I was able to show that. And I don't know, I don't know that I would have been able to show that w without your program. So yeah. I mean, that 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 for us was just was just phenomenal. It is, and you know, I've spoken to a number of leaders in different businesses that always talk about challenges in leadership roles with with engaging and connecting with teams and if you look at it again going back to the talent crisis that we're in um, those leaders are not maximizing upon the potential of their existing teams so if you can bring about these programs and better onboarding better mentoring better dialogue 
uh, better interviews, job descriptions, the whole piece, then naturally without even going out and making a hire, you're going to be lifting that, that potential, um, which is really neat. And it actually reminds me of a story I asked my dad once. He was very fortunate, had a great career with a global mining company. Uh, and I asked him, what was the, what was the big driver of uh, your success in your career? Um, and I was expecting some scientific answer. And he said, uh, you know, a lot of hard work and luck. And I was like, tell me more about luck. And he said, well, in a big organization, there's a hundred other really smart people. But are you one of those smart people that's working hard and gets picked up by the right leader going in the right direction at the right time? And while that was exciting and clearly beneficial for my old man, how many of those other hundred equally smart people got missed out and, you know, didn't achieve the same career progression or left the company and, you know, all of these types of things. So it's a, uh, it's an untapped source of potential. Well, and, and what I find is, is, you know, my best mentors, and it, it sounds like your dad would definitely fall into this category. Uh, you know, st- despite their successes, they stay humble and they stay curious. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah. they're, 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 they know that they know that, you know, uh, there's a certain amount of luck that, that happens yes. in any of these situations. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and yet they work hard and they prepare to try and create that luck as much as they can. But they, any, any success they have, they hopefully, you know, they meet with a, with a level of humility because, yeah. you know, we know there's an awful lot of talented people out there. And it's, a, it's a, I, I just speak for myself, it's an absolute privilege to get to do what I do. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. And I, it, it excites me every time we talk about it. So you're now running some programs, not just in... Uh, the U.S., but in in other parts of the world, I know you, you referenced uh, some big centers down in Latin America and over in Asia Pacific. That's right. That's yeah. right. So so we we went uh, we started in in uh, in nineteen uh, in Texas, actually yeah. national in twenty twenty, yeah, uh, and then this year we went international. So it's uh, wonderful we, we working with a U.S. client, but. Um, working, working, uh, uh, we've got a big set of opportunities in Buenos Aires in Argentina Mm -hmm. that we're working on right now, uh, and, and working with those managers and, and, and doing our, doing our stars program, running a a similar stars program in Manila as well. Um, so yeah, those have been great. Um, it's, it's, uh, you, you talk about, uh, you know, approaching it with humility. We've definitely done that, right? Yes. We, 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 we're seeing, we're encouraged by the fact that we're seeing that a lot of the best practices that work, because we were really worked throughout the US. We will yeah. get thrown, you know, uh, the example I typically use is engineering opportunities in Reno. Yeah. Uh, right. Where a customer just said, hey, here's the need. Can you help us with it? You know, it's, it's, it's a plus and minus thing, right? That there are neurodistinct candidates who are unfortunately available in every city in the country. Yes. And so the mechanisms we've used to attract those candidates and what we've learned about attracting candidates in Reno or in Tallahassee, we found a lot of it maps to what we find when we're overseas now. Right. Uh, a, lot, a lot of it maps. Now, there are some differences. Uh, we'll look at like hard and soft factors. So we'll look at hard factors would be like um, employment law, right? And right. Other right. Is how, how is yeah. disability treated and those things? And then we'll look at soft factors, uh, which are more cultural, right? So how is how how does the culture view difference, right? Yes. And what's the language that's used? And 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 are we up against anything there that we need to be aware of? Um, so we do a, a deep dive on, on any city that we go to. Basically, it's our it's it's a similar process, but then we run it through our kind of hard and soft filter, yeah. right? To see okay, what needs to change given that we're in this because because. You know, a lot of these cities are similar, but sort of like our programs, everyone is a little bit different. So it's just about figuring out, um, you know, what you need to do to be successful in those places. But the, the returns so far have been great. That's fantastic. So as you now look forward into the, the future and you think about uh, potential workforce and some of the programs your customers are running and, and you know, this wider global movement around neurodiversity, um, what are your sort of hopes and dreams for teamwork in the future? Where do you see, uh, you know, Charlie is a 36 year old. What do you, what do you think we can go out there and achieve in the, in the coming sort of five, 10, 15 years? So, yeah, I, I think ultimately for us, the, the, the objective is to work ourselves out of a job. Mm-hmm. So 
where we start, you know, every program we do is a bit different, but we recommend that you start small so that you can learn as a company how to do things in your environment best, right? Yeah. Ultimately, the companies we work with, we let them know, listen, this is your neurodiversity program. Yeah. We'll, we'll advise, we'll recommend, we'll share with you what other people are doing, we'll, we'll, we'll share best practices, but ultimately the company's got to decide how to implement this and they've got to own it. Yeah. We start small there, then the program expands and then it becomes maybe a national or a global program, right? And, yeah. and it, it expands in its scope. But ultimately we want it to just become, we've got to come up with a better expression with this, but we sort of say like part of the wallpaper, you know, yeah. it just becomes part of how you do what you do. It becomes part of your overall human capital strategy. Yeah. And we want companies to get there where they're just like, well, of course we know how to, you know, uh, of course we're, we're, we're ND friendly and we've optimized for that in our college recruiting because we've optimized for it everywhere. Yes. Right? And our, 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 our existing hires and, and our leadership team, where we know we've got neurodistinct individuals. Yeah. In case people thought that wasn't the case, we see it all the time. We have people who, who disclose to us, hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm executive at this company. And I'm, right. Um, but ultimately it's about it's about getting that company to have this be just part of their overall human capital strategy. And when they do that, and when enough companies do that, we'll be out of a job and that'll be just fine. I love it. And going back to your early uh, example, uh, working with Charlie in the early years, you know, year to year, and now starting to think about future planning, 26, 36, 46, I think a lot more parents, a lot more families, a lot more individuals will see much more clarity in, in the pathways that are open to them once this is standard operating procedure for, for human capital strategies. I certainly hope so. Yeah. And I, I know we say, you know, expose your kids to a whole bunch of different things. Right. And, yeah. and, and and if they try something and they don't like it or they don't have immediate success, that's OK. Right. Yeah. But but for a lot in, in the ND community, you know, finding that passion, finding something that really lights you up every day. Yeah. Um, to do that, you've got to you've got to try a whole bunch of different things. And yeah. It doesn't mean that's going to be your job from day one. Right. But but if you have an idea of things, maybe maybe you work to support that. Maybe you want to be an artist and you haven't found a way to do, to do that as a, as a full-time career, but your work gives you, you know, uh, incredible, uh, you know, uh, enjoyment and allows you to, to, to support to do that your art. Hobby. Yeah. To do your art, right? It could be, could be that. So, but, but you know, getting exposure to all kinds of different things is really, is really the key. Um, so, so really wide aperture there. And then for Charlie, it's just finding that next stair step, right? Yeah. So, so for him, it's, you know, don't ask him to jump, you know, uh, uh, five steps at once, but yeah. don't keep him level either, right? And to introduce some challenge and help him get to his next level. So right now for Charlie, that's that's finishing high school, uh, that's learning how to drive, yeah, and um, and and getting a part time job. So those are going to be the next couple of things that are going to happen for him. Um, and then obviously, you know, college is going to be not not too far not too far after that. So yeah. um, so he's got his stair steps. Um, and, and he's got things that he loves to do. And it's just it's just about, you know, supporting him as a family and, and uh, just enjoying the awesome kid that he is. That's great. Well, thanks for joining today, Jeff. Wonderful work that you're doing and, uh, and, and huge impact, not just, not just for individual people, but for companies, for communities, which is so exciting. For anyone who's listening to the show and wants to reach out and make contact, learn a bit more about maybe starting a, a STARS program with you, What's the best way for them to find you, Jeff? Sure. So our, our website is uh, Potential Workforce. So Potential is like Potential without the L. Yeah. So, so PotentialWorkforce.com. Uh, they can reach me at Jeff.Miller at PotentialWorkforce.com or kind of our general is info at PotentialWorkforce.com. Any of those, um, you, can, you, can, you can register or ask questions off of our website or just email us directly. Uh, anyone out there who's interested in neurodiversity, we'd love to hear from you. Wonderful.